are pretty on Ulysses. Hello booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a very special tag. This is the Burden of Proof tag. An original tag by Britta Bowler and also known as the Jacqueline Booktube Bar Exam tag because Jacqueline of Six Minutes for Me just a few days ago passed the Texas Bar Exam. Congratulations Jacqueline and Britta has very delightfully created this very lawyer-like, lawyerly, la lawyered up tag for us to uh, celebrate. By the way, did you know that I was a lawyer? No, I wasn't a lawyer. I was a legal secretary and then a paralegal for about a decade before I became an English teacher. Decade or more. Paralegal for a decade, I think. Yeah, a long time, so... So, question number one, billable hours, a book in which money plays an important role. And for this one, I have chosen one of my favorite novels by Anthony Trollope, The Way We Live Now. I believe it was published in 1875, after Tr uh, Trollope had just come back to England from abroad. I never did catch where he'd been. Steve must know. And it portrays the way that money was corrupting the entire society of England at that time. There had been all kinds of financial scandals in the 1870s, and Trollope was uh, using that as fodder for this novel. It's a wonderful novel, and the main character is a financier with a mysterious past, Augustus Melmott, and there's all, there's a typical Trollopean plot twists and wonderfully drawn characters. I'm just going to quickly share with you what he wrote in his autobiography about why he wrote this novel. And just see how much it resonates with 2019. Nevertheless, a certain class of dishonesty, dishonesty magnificent in its proportions and climbing into high places, has become at the same time so rampant and so splendid that there seems to be reason for fearing that men and women will be taught to feel that dishonesty, if it can become splendid, will cease to be abominable. If dishonesty can live in a gorgeous palace with pictures on all its walls, and gems in all its cupboards, with marble and ivory in all its corners, and can give apician dinners, and get into parliament, and deal in millions, then dishonesty is not disgraceful, and the man dishonest after such a fashion is not a low scoundrel. Instigated, I say, by some such reflections as these, I sat down in my new house to write The Way We Live Now. Number two, Pacta Sunt Servanda. Go, please go back to Britta's erudite tag where he, she explains a lot of this terminology because I can't remember what that means. But what she's calling for here is a, cla a modern classic or a classic with a legal twist that everybody should read. I'm not sure this is something that everybody should read, but I don't read these kinds of books particularly, so my mind flashed back to a book that I bet none of you have ever heard of. And this is a book from Canada about a high-powered lawyer whose clients include the Prime Minister of Canada and one of Canada's most famous commercial novelists, extremely rich novelist. The lawyer got so swept up in 1980s living, and in terms of greed and sexual shenanigans, that he ended up having a love affair with the famous author's daughter and fathering twins, leaving his wife, but his wife had all the stocks and bonds and threatened him with financial ruin and so he he abandoned his pregnant girlfriend his client's daughter and then all hell broke loose and there was a huge scandal at the law firm so that's the book doesn't that sound like an interesting thriller especially when it culminates in the lawyer back home with his wife and grown children uh, shoots himself in the head in the shower this is a true story and it's called Blue Trust, The Author, The Lawyer, His Wife, and Her Money by Stevie Cameron. 
The lawyer was Bruce Verscher, and he, if I'm remembering correctly, he killed himself in about 1993, but I'm not exactly sure. The, the author is Arthur Haley, author of Airport, etc. And I joined the law firm of Bennett Jones Verscher in 1995. Again, I'm not sure if I'm remembering the dates. I think so, 1995. Anyway, it was just over a year after Bruce Verscher's suicide that I got hired as a legal secretary. And my boss had been intimately mixed up in all of that. And Arthur Haley was still, after all this, he was still retaining my boss as his lawyer and I actually spoke to him on the phone once you know for two minutes so yeah and you can read all the juicy details in Blue Trust oh my number three construction law a book that dazzled you with its complex structure so for this one I have chosen because I'm not someone who talks about or pays attention to structure except when something's going wrong and then I start to think about it what's the problem with the structure otherwise I don't, I'm kind of oblivious but uh, I have after some thought I have chosen Italo Calvino's If on a Winter's Night a Traveler his 1979 novel which I absolutely loved I, it's 15 years since I read it uh, I don't typically enjoy postmodern any fiction or never mind especially not theory but postmodern fiction no however this one was just wonderful so to talk about it as simply as possible and i had to check online to re refresh my memory but each chapter is divided into two sections the first section of each chapter is in the second person you 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 and describes what the reader is experiencing in attempting to read the next chapter of the book that you are reading. The second half of each chapter is the first part of a new book that the reader, you, find. So the second half is always about something completely different than the previous ones, and the ending is never explained. It's just <laughs> mind-bogglingly, frustratingly, Delightful. Complex structure, indeed. Number four, The Franklin Rule of Evidence, a, a book with an unreliable narrator. And, you know, I have I couldn't think of anything I'd read that had an unreliable narrator. And I, when I looked at the famous examples, I, I don't like any of those. I don't like fiction that's with an unreliable narrator. I mean, all narrators are unreliable to a certain degree, but the classic examples of an unreliable narrator that I didn't like that one I didn't like that one I didn't like that one so it's not really my bag however I have come up with Room by Emma Donoghue which I read about four years ago and absolutely loved and the the narrator is the five-year-old son Jack his mother was abducted and has been kept prisoner in a shack in the backyard of her captor's house and been his sex slave for more than five years and eventually has a baby who is Jack and Jack is the one narrating he's grown up in this one room little house it's not a house it's just a little tool shed or something but he's grown up never been outside never known any other world other than the world that his mother has tried to create for him in these confines and he is the narrator of the story so obviously unreliable and it's a Marmite book. A lot of people hated the way it was narrated, uh, and I thought it was just stunning. And it's the only book by her that I didn't hate. Number five, Roe v. Wade, a book with a strong female character. I tend to gravitate towards books with strong female characters, and the one that I've chosen is How to Set a Fire and Why by Jesse Ball. The protagonist of this novel is uh, incredibly... Brilliant, misunderstood, fiery teenager whose father has died and mother is in a mental institution and lives with her aunt under very economically uh, less than ideal circumstances and is a scrappy, intellectual, unforgettable protagonist. 
I absolutely love this novel. The title makes sense the more you read, but that was a wonderful novel. How to Set a Fire and Why by Jesse Ball. Number six, Grand Jury, a book with a grand set of characters. And I have chosen a book that I am three quarters of the way through reading, uh, as it happens, in a buddy read with Britta, The Tale of Genji by Murasaki Shikibu. The first novel ever written, a thousand pages, and it grand cast of characters indeed. I don't know, hundreds of characters. And Genji was a prince in the 10th century or something. And... Uh, the style of narration is such that no character is ever, almost none of the characters are ever referred to by anything other than their titles at court. And their titles would often change over the course of the novel. So to follow the characters is just tedious. But each chapter in this translation by Royale Tyler has a dramatis personae so that you can flip back and forth within each chapter but it's still really almost painful to keep track of all the characters and almost all of the women had been seduced by Genji and a large subset had been abducted and or raped so it's a very problematic text with a huge cast of characters. Number seven, Malpractice, a book you loved that features an unlikable character, preferably a professional. I couldn't think of one with a professional, and I am going to come out as somebody who doesn't enjoy reading books with unlikable characters, or an unlikable protagonist, anyway. Sue me. I don't like reading books about people that I don't like. There's got to be somebody in there to root for, at least. Uh, to put it uh, politically correctly... I have to at least care about the characters, but no, I don't like reading fiction that has a bunch of odious characters. I don't. I don't. But one that uh, certainly uh, was a very rich reading experience was Alina Bronsky's The Hottest Dishes of the Tartar Cuisine, <laughs> translated from the German by Tim Moore. So Alina Bronsky is a, she was born in Russia and lives in Germany and writes in German. And this, the main character of this novel, I have a full review, I'll link it. I don't think it's all that great of a review. It's in the early days of my channel. The main character, Rosa, the story is mostly set in the USSR. And when her 17-year-old daughter gets pregnant, who she, she, she always calls her stupid Sophia, she does absolutely everything to thwart the pregnancy every folkloric home remedy to cause uh, an abortion but the baby is born and then Rosa falls in love with her granddaughter and tries to take her away from her daughter because she has no use for her daughter and the story and all the bizarre family dynamics are just they're uproarious and uh, dysfunctional doesn't even begin to cover it but there's something also very touching and she's loathsome, Rosa, but you end up, or I ended up, really caring about her. So, having said all that stuff about I don't like blah, 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 I love this novel. And you should try it. And there are uh, two bonus questions. Uh, one is, number eight, a South African lover you love. I am really interested in South African literature and have read, not widely, but quite a fair amount, and I couldn't think of one writer, but this is true of any country. It's hard for me to think of a writer that I've loved more than one book by them. So I'm going with the first South African uh, book that I ever read. I studied it in high school. Peter Abraham's memoir, Tell Freedom. It was a high school on the curriculum for my high school English course. Peter Ab Abrahams was born in 1919 in South Africa, and he went into, I guess didn't call it exile, but he lived after from the 1950s until his death two years ago. At the age of 97, he was murdered. It was so sad, but he lived in the UK and then Jamaica. But his memoir, Tell Freedom, was the first thing that I ever read about apartheid um, and South Africa, and I absolutely loved it, and it awakened a lifelong interest. I've still never read any of Peter Abraham's fiction, note to self, but it's a very important book, book in my reading life and then just like I say, really uh, sparked a lifelong interest in the country.
Uh, number nine, a book about animals in an unusual setting. Recently, I've been complaining about how many animals were showing up in my fiction and crowding out the human characters. But uh, so this is one I haven't read, and it's I've got it on Kindle, and uh, I must get to it. It is We Love You, Charlie Freeman by Caitlin Greenidge. Greenidge is an African-American novelist, and I'm not sure if this is her first novel, but it's the only one I've ever heard about. It was published just a few years ago, and it's about an African-American family that get hired. And the African-American family sounds like they're very quirky because the mother is not deaf, but she became fascinated by sign language as a young child and learned it fluently and made her entire family, her husband and the kids, learn it. There's nobody in the family that's deaf. But because they're all so fluent in sign language, they get hired to go to this institute that is ostensibly for uh, teaching gorillas to communicate. And this family gets hired to work with a gorilla, I think the name of the animal is Charlie Freeman, to teach it how to communicate. But then there's something more racist and nefarious that they discover is uh, going on at the Institute, and that's all I know, and uh, that's on the back cover, and I want to read it, and that's my answer for this prompt. The last one, Partners in Crime, tag some fellow booktubers. I don't think you need to know Jacqueline, but of course any of you who are on booktube know and love Jacqueline, but I don't think you need to know Jacqueline to do the tag because the prompts are so interesting. So I am tagging Alba of Siriella, Sonia of An Enthusiastic Reader, Karen of Run Right Reads, Roz of A Journey Through Books, Lukash of Totally Pretentious, and of course anyone else who would like to do it. And let's just close with a little joke. Did you hear about the two gay judges? They tried each other. Thanks for watching. <laughs>